going to be talking to you today about transcription organization. And so, I guess to this crowd, it's very well known about how transcription is regulated in terms of spatial organization. And so, you know, for maybe two decades, it's been known that it's been possible to observe clusters of RNA polymerase in the nucleus of our cells. And more recently, there's been a lot more work looking at this about bringing together clusters, factories or hubs or condensates of RNA polymerase, transcription regulators and chromatin into these, uh, into these uh, clusters. A lot of work has now been going on looking at uh, these clusters which exist and how they relate to transcription regulation, transcription function. And this is where we have an interest in my lab in understanding what can be going on to help form these structures, stabilize these structures and look at factors which can play a role. And so we are in particular interested in therefore looking at how we can investigate these organizations of transcription units within our cells. And to do that, we use super resolution microscopy and in particular single molecule localization microscopy. So in this case, we're performing a standard IF procedure but using this form of microscopy, we can localize individual molecules with high precision within the nucleus and then look at their relatively, the relative spatial organization to each other. Now, that allows us to go from this relatively normal confocal image that you can see here into a super resolution image, where now we can directly see that we have these clusters of uh, RNA polymerase II within the nucleus. And we build up these images by actually localizing individual molecules. So in other words, we know exactly how many molecules are localized within these clusters. And due to the precision of our measurements, we can also then look at the area and spatial changes and number of these clusters quite easily and quantify uh, the numbers within the cell. So we're interested in this, looking at what may be going on to help form these structures. And so it was quite interesting that last year, a paper was published on nuclear actin. And now actin has been associated with transcription for many years. And what was found last year is that going away more from the fact of just saying that actin can be associated to RNA polymerase and it can help support transcription. This paper actually showed that when you stimulate transcription, you get enhanced levels of these RNA polymerase II clusters but also it coincides with the ability of the cell to generate um, polymerized actin emanating from these RNA polymerase clusters. And it is the polymerized actin in the nucleus here which helps stabilize these pol 2 clusters. Now that's very interesting for our work because from my perspective, we are interested in myosin motors. Now, myosin motors work hand in hand essentially with actin. So typically you'll find a myosin motor which will bind to an actin filament and it can either bind and hold and anchor down onto these filaments to provide a structural support or they can step along these actin filaments to transport cargo around the cell. It's therefore not surprising that myosins are associated with numerous different functions throughout the cell and these can include from uh, providing support to cellular structures such as microvilli or stereocilia through to endocytosis and axocytosis, moving molecular cargo around the cell. But we're interested as to what these myosins are doing in the nucleus. The myosins have been discovered in the nucleus since the late 90s. And again, they've been associated to roles in transcription. And in particular in my lab, we focus on a myosin called myosin 6. And a few years ago now, we were able to show that this myosin um, is not only present in the nucleus, but actually has the ability to bind DNA through its C-terminal domain. And so we did lots of biochemistry mapping both DNA binding. We did in vitro transcription experiments where we saw if we deplete myosin-6 from uh, cell lysates, we lose uh, transcriptional capabilities. We looked at how the myosin interacts with RNA polymerase 2, and more details can be found in the paper here. But essentially what we're able to do is put together this rough schematic of what we understand from the interactions. And so we know that myosin-6 requires, uh, requires binding partners to regulate its motor activity. 
and we know its C terminals can bind to DNA, as we showed in this paper. And then we were able to show that myosin is interacting with RNA polymerase 2 through a form of filamentous actin. So in this way, myosin can then exist in this sort of organization. Now, this paper revealed these different types of interactions which can form, but it didn't really tell us much about what does the myosin do or why is a myosin needed for transcription. And so that's where we became very interested in thinking about the organization of transcription and whether the myosins can help support any of these structures which we have observed in the nucleus for many years now. And so we set out to do the super resolution technique, looking at both RNA polymerase 2 and myosin 6. And so myosin 6, along with RNA polymerase 2, forms these clusters which exist in the nucleus. And this is the two color image here of myosin 6 and pol 2. But seen here more clearly, if we look at myosin 6, we get again these defined clusters or aggregations of the protein. But what's very interesting is if we stimulate transcription, and in this case, we're just using serum, we see an increase in the size of these pol 2 clusters, as has been seen by many other labs over the years. And we also see an increase in the size of the myosin 6 clusters. And indeed, they also show co-localization with each other. So therefore, OK, we have this interesting observation now that myosin 6, when you stimulate transcription, it seems to increase in its size and increases its interaction with pole 2. So that fits with the biochemistry data we presented previously in our work, where it was able to show that myosin 6 is involved in transcription with pole 2. But still, we're not really sure what is this protein doing with pole 2 when you stimulate transcription. And so therefore, we were able to take advantage of both performing a knockdown of myosin 6, so to deplete it using sRNA, and we also have a small molecule inhibitor. And this inhibitor uh, disrupts the ATPase activity of the motor protein, and therefore disrupts its whole ability to interact with actin and function as a motor protein. And so as you can see here on the left, we have a distribution of RNA polymerase 2 in the nucleus. And what we found is if we perturbed myosin 6, pol 2s distribution, and I want to just highlight now, this is the SIR5, so transcription initiation state of pol 2 so it's not the elongation form, it becomes very disrupted within the cell. And we see this sort of aggregation around the periphery of the nucleus. Now, some at pol 2 remains within the nuclear body. We not, do not have a complete disruption of pol 2s organization but a large amount of pol 2 becomes disorganized. So we now became very interested to think, okay, this looks really interesting. We have seen this disruption of pol 2 when we've perturbed myosin 6. What happens when we also perturb actin? As I said before, myosin and actin typically work together. So we did a treatment with latrunculin B, which stops polymerization of actin. And we also transfected a monomeric form of actin, which prevents polymerization by binding and capping other monomers to stop this um, process emanating from RNA polymerase when you get transcription stimulation. Now, in both cases, what we observed was a perturbed pol 2 localization once more. So a disruption of myosin or actin disrupts the organization of pol 2. So we therefore thought, OK, myosin is therefore involved in this organization steps from a sort of structural point of view. And it does this, as we would suspect, through it's also its interaction with actin, which we know is connected to RNA polymerase 2 as well. So what we wanted to just test was when we have this perturbed localization of pole 2 is it still bound to chromatin? So does chromatin move with pole 2 or is it actually completely released from chromatin? And what we find is if we look using CHIP and we selected a series of serum responsive genes here, we see, if you look at the enrichment levels here on the scale, that when we use the myosin 6 inhibition, we lose pole 2 from the chromatin. And this loss of pole 2 or depletion of pole 2 does not correlate with a loss of protein. As you can guess from the images, we still have a large amount of protein and also confirmed by Western blot. When we do the myosin 6 perturbations, we don't lose RNA polymerase 2 protein level. So we are really removing pol 2 from the chromatin. So we therefore became interested to understand a bit more of the dynamics of this process to move away from doing the static super resolution imaging, which is performed on fixed cells, 
So we wanted to look at live cell single molecule tracking of Pol2 to understand when we go from these two different forms of Pol2 distribution, can we also see that in terms of the physical properties of how Pol2 moves around the nucleus? Now, unfortunately, this video here um, is not playing through my PowerPoint, but actually these white specks here are single molecules of RNA polymerase 2, and you would be able to see those moving around if the video was playing. But this video actually would highlight that we're looking there at just a 2D view um, in the nucleus. But of course, the nucleus is quite a large 3D body. And therefore, we went across the Advanced Imaging Center and we performed 3D uh, multifocal tracking. And in this case, we can observe nine focal planes simultaneously and perform single molecule tracking, allowing us to see if a molecule moves from the top to the bottom of the nucleus and not just moving laterally across during our field of view. So in this way, we can really track RNA polymerase II dynamics through the whole body of the nucleus. And this is an example of the different mapped tracks which we can observe when Pol2 is uh, moving throughout, uh, throughout the nucleus. And what you can see is that we have motile states, so molecules which are moving around, and others which display very sort of confined or immobile states, as shown here and here. So what we typically observed is under normal conditions, we see that some of the pole 2 has this mobile activity, but also a large amount of it is actually very confined or immobile, which makes sense because pole 2 can form clusters. And if pole 2 forms a cluster, a transcription hub or a condensate even, it's going to be relatively static. But what we found is if you did the tip treatment, we start to lose a lot of those static structures and pole 2 is becoming more dynamic. And from these tracks, we can actually then also map the uh, pull out the diffusion constants. And then we see that if we perturb myosin 6 with a small molecule inhibitor, or perform the knockdown, or perturb actin, as we did in the storm measurements, in all cases, we see an increase in diffusion. And that increase in diffusion, we kind of relate to the fact of it makes a lot of sense from looking at the storm data, because if we are losing clusters, we would expect pole 2 to become more dynamic and therefore move around the nu nucleus more and form less of these static structures. So the two pieces of data fit together quite nicely. What was also very interesting is that we can also see when we do serum stimulation to stimulate transcription, we do see a population drop in terms of the diffusion rate, again, fitting the idea that we form more static structures and more clusters. So again, it fits with what we see in the storm data. So that leads us to put together this sort of schematic of what we think myosin 6 may be doing. So this is a very simplified diagram just trying to highlight the critical structures. So first of all, we have this protein core where you would expect to find also different transcription factors at the heart of these sort of condensates and structures which exist when you form these factories. And DNA is very likely to actually interact with any of these proteins, but this is just shown in a very simplified format. So we have RNA polymerase 2, we have then actin coming out of pole 2, as has been shown previously. And we suggest that the myosin 6 is interacting with transcription regulators through its C-terminus and also DNA, as we showed previously. And then it's coupled onto RNA polymerase 2 through actin. And we suggest that pole 2 is actually being anchored and stabilized through myosin 6, helping to support the formation of these clusters and helping to stabilize them where myosin 6 is using its motor activity to act as a scaffold and therefore enhance the chance of capturing pole 2 and holding it within these structures for transcription to initiate and to occur. Now, we would expect, therefore, I've seen in these uh, storm images and as simplified in this cartoon, that you're going to have many of these structures throughout the nucleus, and that's going to form many different cross-link points. And to test this idea of you know, pole two forming cross links. It's already been shown that where you have these condensates, structures, factories of pole two, you reduce chromatin dynamics because chromatin is held together in cross link. And if you deplete pole two, chromatin becomes more dynamic, moves around more because you've lost the cross links. And it's also been shown that if you perturb DNA cross linking, which is linked through proteins, you also change nuclear mechanics. And so what we also did 
is that we're able to perform AFM. And with, through the AFM, we can probe the nucleus directly and measure how stiff it is as an organelle. And therefore, we can do this under normal growth conditions and be able to determine how stiff the nucleus is, how strong it's held together. But if we treat with the myosin 6 inhibitor, we see that the nucleus becomes a lot softer, it becomes significantly softer. And so this fits with this idea that we're able to disrupt POL2, disrupt these crosslinks, the nucleus becomes a more fluid environment and therefore becomes softer. So it's a nice way to sort of correlate what we've observed through our imaging with the physical properties of what occurs within the organelle. Now, along with looking at what occurs with POL2, because of the large changes we see, we've then wanted to expand upon what may occur to the underlying chromatin when these changes occur. And we've turned to doing a high content screen. So we're actually now looking at thousands of cells and looking at different histone markers. So we're looking at active markers. And what we see in this case is that if we use the myosin 6 inhibitor, active marker expression decreases. And if we look at a repressive marker, we see when we have the inhibitor, we see an increase in the repressive marks. So this makes sense that we're now changing POL2, we're actually changing the chromatin environment as well in response to that. And not surprisingly, there's also an impact on gene expression. So if we knock out myosin 6 and then look at the RNA-seq, we see a large amount of genes are decreased in their expression. And we found a lot of those are related to regulation of uh, stimulation events, signaling events, which fits with the idea of transcriptional change. So if you stimulate transcription, you need this myosin 6 response to sort of hold POL2 together, which again is seen many, many times when you look at formation of POL2 clusters, factories, or condensates. If you stimulate transcription, you see those condensates form. But what's quite interesting is along that basis is thinking about what we saw when we stimulated transcription. We saw myosin 6 co-localizing with POL2 when we treated cells with serum. If we go through and look at a whole list of serum responsive genes, we see that a lot of them, in fact, the majority of them, show a decreased expression. And to test this more, we turn to an RTQ-PCR approach where we starve cells, treated them with serum. You can see here in green, we get an increase in the gene expression level as expected from the serum responsive genes. And again, if we do a knockdown of myosin 6 and treat with serum, we don't see that upregulation. So the serum response is dependent upon having myosin 6 present. And just to confirm as well, if we do a chip against myosin 6, we do see myosin 6 at the promoters of these genes as well. And we do want to perform a chip seek analysis of myosin 6 uh, to actually look at generally how myosin 6 is spread around the genome to understand chromatin organization a bit more as well. So we have this idea, we have this map that's, you know, schematic that myosin 6 is holding pole 2 together, forming these cross links within the nucleus and forming this sort of stabilization of transcription initiation. We really wanted to test the idea of myosin 6 scaffolding or anchoring pole 2 directly. And so to do that, we wanted to perturb the myosin motor concept. Now, to briefly explain this to a non-myosin field, the best way is to think about a litter picker. So if you squeeze the handle, it closes the gripper and it holds on to whatever it's picking up very tight. Myosins can respond in a similar fashion, whereby if you have a myosin bound to an actin filament, if you apply force, so you pull back on the myosin, similar to closing the handle, it will bind actin even tighter. And so we had this idea that if pole 2 is within these structures, myosin binds the actin, which is connected to pole 2. If the pole 2 starts to diffuse away or move or moves on some DNA, it's going to exert a large force because of the size of pole 2. It's going to exert a large force across the myosin and therefore could help to enable myosin to go to an anchor mode, and that enhances its ability to hold things together. So to try and perturb this ability of myosin to act as an anchor, what happens usually with the myosin is that you get force exerted at the seed terminus, you get a pull on the motor, and this transfers onto the motor domain, which changes its ability to interact with actin. So we incorporated a molecular spring into the 
C-terminal half of the myosin motor. And now, instead of the force being transferred onto the motor domain, the force is dispersed across this molecular spring. And in doing that, we disrupt the ability of myosin 6 to become this anchor. So it shouldn't hold on to acting as tightly. It should not stabilize pole 2 organization as much based on our hypothesis. And that's exactly what we see when we then transfect this construct into the cell where we've knocked down endogenous myosin 6. Now, we do see a slight rescue of pole 2 organization depending upon the cells we look at. So it does start to show some rescue ability, but mostly pole 2 still shows that disrupted um, distribution. And again, we do not see a rescue in gene expression phenotype to a significant level. And just to show that knockdown of myosin 6 and transfection does work to stabilize pole 2, if we knock down the endogenous myosin 6 and transfect with wild type, we see again the increase in pole 2 clusters. And indeed, if we quantify the amount of pole 2 clusters we see, we actually see an increase in the amount of pole 2 clusters. So we can both deplete and enhance pole 2 clustering by playing with that level of myosin 6 within the nucleus. So this is therefore our final model idea where we can say that the myosin connected through to acting filaments has the ability to hold and stabilize and grab pole 2 into these uh, structures. And therefore, we can help say that myosin helps support transcription initiation. And we're very much interested to know what happens during the elongation phase as throughout the transcription cycle to see a little bit more about what's going on with transcription involving these myosins. And finally, this goes to address what may actually be a function of a myosin within the nucleus in transcription, rather than just saying a myosin has some involvement, it can form interactions with these proteins. Now we can actually say that it takes the myosin's capability of interacting with actin and becoming a motor protein which anchors onto actin. It uses that ability to help stabilize these transcription units. So what I want to do is now to say thank you to the main people involved in this work throughout the lab. So that was Yukti, who performed most of the work along with Natalie and Alia throughout the past few years. We've had many sort of people leave and turn over in the lab recently. And I just want to say thank you to all the lab members which have contributed to this over the years. And of course, our collaborators and funders. And if you want to see a little bit more about this work, you can check out two preprints where we look at the spatial organization, that's what I've been described in today. Also, we have a second paper looking at how myosin moves along nuclear actin filaments and how this may be stabilizing and changing chromatin organization over large scales within the nucleus. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Chris. Very interesting topic. Um, there are a few questions in the, in the Q&A. Uh, maybe I start with those. So Jan Palacek asks whether nuclear myosins drive relocalization of other chromatin domains like heterochromatic breaks. And so therefore is myosin 6 specific for transcription or may it, indirect, may it act indirectly in transcription? So, no, that's a really interesting question. So, we are interested in what myosin 6 may be doing when you have heterochromatic breaks. So, there is still more to be revealed. We believe the response to transcription is specific based on, you know, when we can sort of see um, stimulation events where myosin 6 may respond. And also, we're looking at other now transcription factors or regulators and how myosin 6 is responding to their activity as well. But I think a bit like what happens in the cytoplasm is that these myosins are almost like, you know, um, a truck or a lorry, and they transport and interact with many things throughout the whole cytoplasm. And I think they're going to be utilized in many ways in the nucleus, and people are only really just starting to now look at what may be going on. And I think the whole presence of these type of motors in the nucleus makes a lot of sense because the nucleus is actually so large, be, you know, several microns, 10, maybe 20 microns long so you need to really be able to transport things from one side to the other then we have another question from uh, genevieve 
um, asking, you know, BAF remodeler complexes contain both actin and actin related subunits. How do you envisage their dynamic interaction with nuclear actin filaments? So that's a very interesting question. So I am not too much from the actin side of things. So I have to sort of clarify that because looking at nuclear actin itself is a very specialized um, topic, shall we say? And it's therefore also very important to consider the fact that you have nuclear actin filaments, which are very dynamic, whereas actin usually with the spasm where the re, like, remodeler such as BAF is actually part of the innate structure. So you have like monomeric actin. Now, I'm not sure if you get filamentous actin working with those complexes or not. I just don't really know enough about them. Uh, thanks, Chris, Paul, for this very nice and interesting talk. So I was wondering um, why polymerase relocalized at the periphery of the nucleus? And did you perform also high C uh, on your uh, myosin uh, mutant cells to see if there is a um, also inside the chromosome territories? Yeah, so um, a few things of interest. So why does it go to the periphery? Uh, we can't say for sure. I mean, there's definitely a few possibilities. One is that if Pol2 is now being, you know, lost from the chromatin, is there kind of, you know, starting to degrade? Is it being exported in any fashion? Two, there's also this possibility that actually if chromatin is becoming transcriptionally inactive, is it condensing more? And actually, if you think of you know, the nucleus being this sort of volume, the chromatin can condense and maybe it fills a bit inside. You've actually got a gap at the periphery between the nucleus membrane and chromatin. Maybe it's a bit more of a void, which it can diffuse into, and then it kind of accumulates over time. So that's, you know, possibilities, but nothing which I could say definitively about why that occurs. Um, high C, have we done high C? That's actually something we are wanting to do. So we sort of have it in the pipeline. It's really what we're trying to get on top of because we want to look at how chromatin territories, uh, chromosome territories do change. Now, we've done some um, chromosome paint type analysis, and we do see changes in chromatin, uh, chromosome uh, layout and position and therefore well, now we really want to sort of do first of all you know chip seat just make sure everything works and then build up to this sort of high c context to really understand again we think there's probably multiple functions of this myosin so yes you have the transcriptional element but again it could have many other functions too and this is the same problem you have in the cytoplasm of these proteins you can't easily just disrupt let's say endocytosis without disrupting mitochondrial organization it's yeah. difficult to work with. So maybe I can sneak in just a question for clarification. In your experiment yeah. where you lost Pol2 from, from chromatin, this was only by, by imaging, right? Or did you check by chip seek that you... Uh, we didn't do chip seek. What we did, we've done chip, and then we've basically took um, serum responsive genes, which we were looking at, and it was essentially lost across everywhere we looked. By qPCR? Yeah. Okay. And uh, maybe I can sneak in just another quick question before I get back to the Q&A. So uh, has actin been visualized in the nucleus? I, I missed it. Yes. Um, so actually also in our other preprint paper, we've visualized actin there and also other labs have been visualizing actin. One of the key differences is that sometimes people use cytoplasmic actin as a marker for their cells. But usually what you see there is actually large bundles and filaments of actin rather than individual strands of actin, which appears to be more the case in the nucleus is that you have these strands <laughs> versus a bundled structural filament. So uh, Kirsten asks, uh, have you looked if genes change their position using the myosin-6 inhibitor just doing fish? I think you... Yeah, so we've done um, whole chromosome paint so far and yes we do see changes um in some of the chromosome positioning uh relative relative positioning and again we want to do more now with fish but also i remember seeing uh kirsten's talk a few weeks ago now and actually we're quite interested in looking at some of these you know chromosome marker you know marking different aspects of the chromosomes and actually then looking at their relatively changing position and whether myosin could be moving some segments of the chromosome directly. In your model, myosin is bound to actin through its head and to pol2 through its tail. 
You mentioned that ChIP-seq will tell us if myosin-6 is bound to specific DNA sequences. How do you think a myosin molecule bound to actin and Pol2 could be directly bound to DNA? So, uh, yeah, so right, the myosin is bound to actin for its motor domain. And then actually the C-terminal segment is what interacts uh, with different protein factors which help activate the myosin. So these are, we've already, sh we've been able to show that there's some nuclear receptors involved in this, probably other transcriptional regulators too. So you have the motor domain where Pol2 is interacted with through that, and then DNA is at the C-terminal end. And the way we sort of think of is that more that the myosin is then not going to really be bound to specific sequences, we don't think. Uh, we think its specificity is indirect, probably through interaction with transcription regulators. So for example, we've been able to show interactions with the estrogen receptor in breast cancer positive cell lines. And so the myosin-6 is actually targeted by the estrogen receptor. And then the myosin's capability is kind of utilized in that area. But the myosin itself does not really have a ability to bind specific sequences.